My pleasure to introduce our uh, closing speaker, Cecil Scheib. Um, so we, we like to say we're, you know, we're here at the intersection of Interstate 81 and 690. And we like to say that this is West 690th Street and 81st Avenue, the extreme upper west side of New York City. The Urban Green Council <laughs> is, uh, is the New York City chapter of the US Green Building Council. And, uh, and Cecil believed us when, he, when we said we're the extreme Upper West Side. So he took the subway, which led to Penn Station, <laughs> and got on a train and took Amtrak and got, got here almost 48 hours ago. And this is his first trip to Syracuse, and I hope it won't be his last, because this is the extreme Upper West Side. Um, Cecil, uh, we've asked Cecil to give a presentation in which he shares his own life journey. So I'm gonna just very briefly do it chronologically. So born in the Bronx, played the trombone, went to Stanford, uh, helped start an eco-village in Missouri, came back to New York City, landed a job with NYU, and then uh, moved to, uh, to the Urban Green Council. So um, mo most recently at the Urban Green Council, after Superstorm Sandy, there was a um, task force that was put together by the city of New York on building resiliency. And Cecil was the managing director of that, of that task force, which put out a report on, on lessons learned. The Urban Green Council has done um, an extraordinary uh, effort in leading the community in New York City about the building stock in New York City with uh, terrific reports on uh, a vi vision which we're going to hear about, about reducing carbon emissions 90% by 2050 in, in buildings. And also the impact on of power outages and scenarios of losing power in the wintertime or in the summertime. There's this terrific report called Baby It's Cold Inside. <laughs> uh, so the Urban Green Council, I just lift, lift up as a, um, um, as, as, a, as a wonderful resource for New York City, for New York State, for, uh, for the country. And, uh, and it's great, great to have Cecil here. He is the Chief Program Officer for the Urban Green Council. And, uh, and a new member of uh, Syracuse's extreme Lower East Side, Cecil Shaw. Thank you very much, Ed, for that lovely introduction. Um, okay, I know I am the guy that is standing in between you and your beer, so I'm gonna get through this briskly and leave lots of time for questions and then we will all go have a beer. And of course, we're so grateful you stayed for the keynote Ed mentioned to me just before I went on, I think this is what he said he's gonna buy you all. <laughs> <laughs> I think it was loud, it may not have been what he said, so you should check with them yourself. Uh, you might have said it. I'd also like to thank uh, Andrew and also um, uh, Ron, who are uh, our tech people, who've done a great job during this conference. You say, why does he know the tech guys' names? And this, this is a tip you might like to know. If you're ever on a um, reality TV show, and I was on one, uh, as part of the Ecovillage project, uh, 30 Days comment came and did a special, and you know you can see it on Hulu. And the way things are going, you probably will be on one of those shows one of these days. But I think we all will be. You should always know the names of the tech people because if if you ever do something stupid on camera, you say their name because the whole premise of the show is there's not a camera crew there. It's just they're filming you. So if you say their name, the shots ruined. They can't use that take. So anything you say stupid say their name. So I am prepared. If I say something stupid and you hear me say Ron, you hear me say Andrew, you know it's like a take back for what I say. Okay, so I'm going to tell you a little bit about um, you know, how I got to where I am. And, and I think what's sort of central to part of it is that you know, we all know uh, why we're in this room, right? It's for the free beer from Ed. No, it's not for the free beer from Ed. It's because we know there's a big problem. And it's a global problem. And we know that the people in this room are one of the most important parts of making it better, right? Building, uh, building energy, building carbon, that's where lots of the answers are at. Certainly that's true uh, in the big cities, but that's true uh, you know, on a global level um, uh, you know, as well. 
And, uh, but one of the things we lack is sometimes motivation to make big changes. We're all happy about a 5% energy cut, but you start talking about a 30% cut, a 60% cut, people get a little green around the gills. And part of that's because people don't truly believe that it is possible. And so one of the most motivational things we can do is remind people that it is possible and it is happening. So I'm gonna do a little bit of that here today. Um, just real quickly before I get started, just to get a sense of who's here, and uh, raise your hand, it's okay to raise your hand more than once these questions, raise your hand if you are um, an architect. Okay, engineer, okay, about half and half. If you're a student, pretty cool, and if you're from here in Syracuse, okay, and I guess if you're outside of, if you're outside of Syracuse for sort of completeness, Okay, <laughs> numbers may not add to 100% due to rounding, but okay, good sense, thank you very much. So I first got involved uh, in this topic just about a quarter century ago, uh, right about the time that this happened and was in the news. Uh, there are those of you in the crowd who may recognize this image, this is the uh, Exxon Valdez oil spill off the coast of Alaska. Uh, the guy who was driving the boat, uh, they say, was also drinking. Not a good idea, even in a boat. Ran aground, spilled uh, um, 11 million gallons of oil. That's as much as we use uh, in uh, New York City for heating in about two weeks in winter. <laughs> and uh, it was a bad deal. And so lots of people looked at this uh, picture and said, well, there you go, oil's the problem. We got a supply issue. Why are we using this dirty fuel? It spills, causes carbon. Uh, we got to stop it. Um, we should move to renewables, natural gas, whatever. We should be doing things in a cleaner way. And there's a lot of power to that. People love the idea of they're gonna fix things by putting a solar panel on the roof. But uh, I ended up taking a slightly different path and no small part of that was due to a great ad that actually Greenpeace ran in the New York Times and other outlets at this time. And they started with a picture of the guy who was a boat captain at the time at the Valdez ran aground. Uh, you can see he doesn't look very happy in this picture. I guess I wouldn't either if I had done what he had done, was in the national media for it, and they added this caption. Wasn't his driving that caused the oil spill, it was yours. And that was sort of like an aha moment. That's right, the only reason that oil's on that boat is because I want to put it in my car. I want to heat my house with it. I want to make power with it. I can actually stop that oil from coming. All I have to do is stop burning oil and they'll stop digging it up. Now that's not easy to do, but the fact that the ultimate power is in the hands of the consumer and we do not necessarily have to wait um, for a corporation or our government to fix that for us is a very heady thought, especially if you're 25 years old. And so a bunch of us got together after college and we decided that what if we showed that it was possible to live a lifestyle that made very different choices uh, about oil and other uh, issues, water, waste, and these types of things, but that did not represent a sacrifice. What if we could show people that you could do these things and have a better lifestyle, it was happy, and it was healthy, and you do it with other people. You could build a little village, and it would be off-grid, and you would show the world that these things were possible. And it might have been a bit naive, but we thought that all you had to do was show people it was possible, and people would want to change. Turns out there might be a couple more steps than that. <laughs> Nevertheless, <laughs> We started off, and within a couple years after that oil spill, I found myself building this, the first uh, um, straw bale building built at the Eco Village. Uh, you may not think it's very attractive. That's because uh, we had an um, engineer as the architect. <laughs> You're looking at him. Um, but it did work very well. It used very little wood. It's almost all straw. The um, roof actually sits on the walls. Uh, you know, It's a load-bearing building. Uh, all the wood was local. Uh, the exterior was a lime-based plaster. The interior was a clay-based plaster from what we actually dug out for the foundation. Uh, the whole thing was built for just basically a few thousand dollars, you know, plus our labor. And those three little solar panels run all of the loads uh, for that building. It's basically a very small one-bedroom house. Um, and we thought, okay, this, this is actually working. This has potential. So we moved on. Um, and the second building I helped build, this actually had an architect that you can tell looks a little more exciting. And actually, sort of an interesting twist, uh, you know, um, historically things coming together. The architect was uh, Dan Smith, who uh, was 
instrumental to getting the straw bale building put in the next version of the uh, residential code. Uh, the 2015 IRC will actually have an appendix showing how uh, uh, you can actually permit straw bale building. So it was nice to have us work with us back in those days. This is a six bedroom, two story straw bale building. It has a wood frame this time. Um, but the whole thing is powered by a 2.6 kilowatt array. And that's it, 100% off grid. And that's all it takes. And that's because the building is using less than one kilowatt hour per person per day. Now it also has wood heat, so that's not all the energy it's using, but in terms of the power it's using, it's very, very low. In fact, that's about 90% less than the US average. And this is a building that has ethernet in every room, it has water pumps, it has a refrigerator, everyone's got a computer, lights, the works. I mean, there was no sacrifice made for the lifestyle you lived in this building, but 90% less than the average. Partial, part of this is uh, because of a ruthless rooting out of every standby load and really making things sure that when they are off, they are all the way off. And when you start to, start to build for ultra low energy building, those small loads matter. We've heard lots about that today. But it's the type of thing where if I would buy a router, let's say for the house, let's see, does this router consume eight watts when it's in standby or one watt in standby? It matters if I'm gonna run off of that array and the batteries in the house. Um, so these types of uh, scale of sort of cutting impact uh, in the uh, eco-village, basically one order of magnitude less than, than the uh, average, these also apply to water, uh, they also apply to cars. Uh, the eco-village has uh, 70 people now are sharing four cars and driving 90% less uh, miles per person than the US average, even though it's about 12 miles to the nearest town over 100 people. It's a very rural area. So again, really showing that this type of deep scale reduction is possible. And you can go find all about it uh, you know, on Hulu and send me an email and say, boy, was your hair big. <laughs> no, it was. So I was there for about 12 years, and I did want to come back to New York. Every time I'd go back and visit New York and see friends, I'd say, this is great. And I wanted to swim in a little bit of a larger pond. And I did uh, actually get a job at NYU, as Ed mentioned. NYU is about a 70,000 person community instead of a 70 person community so three orders of magnitude larger. And soon after I got there, we took up a bold challenge issued by the mayor of New York. Um, and at, at that point, the mayor said the city as a whole is gonna cut uh, carbon emissions 30% by the year 2030. And he laid down a challenge to about a dozen of the schools, uh, the city's uh, largest schools saying, can you cut 30% by 2017? And this was in 2007, so it was one decade, 30% cut. It's a smart idea to start with institutions because these are people that are willing to invest in long-term solutions. They think they're gonna own their buildings. They don't think they're gonna outsource their jobs. They're gonna be there. Why not invest? Often they might have access to you know, like the capital, but they'll need to make real change as well. Um, so we started working on that right away. Did lots of other things in terms of making the campus more sustainable, but one of the main things we did uh, was actually work on the energy use, and we're able to cut the energy and the carbon uh, output of the campus, 150 buildings, 12 million square feet, um, by over 30% in just five years. So it didn't take 10, it didn't take five. Uh, sorry, it didn't take 10, it did take five. But one little word can make a difference. Like that. Um, and really, here's the good news, and I, you know, and I love to tell the story, we didn't do anything special. The things we did to cut 30% in five years were way less advanced than all the incredible stuff that we have heard about today. We are talking a uh, simple thing. We're talking lighting sensors. We're talking relamping jobs. We're talking building schedules. Um, we're talking basic tweaks to the BMS. We're talking shooting steam traps so they're not leaking steam all the time. We're talking O&M training. These are, these are very simple things, cost effective, less than than a four-year payback for everything we did for that 30%, and often less than a two-year payback. I had something less than a one-year payback. Obviously, you know, we pay a lot for power in the city, so it does actually help with the paybacks. Um, but this is very achievable. Uh, now, since then, or at that same time, NYU was also building the city's largest private coja, a 13-megawatt uh, plant, and so that's gonna give even larger reductions, because then you're starting to work on source. But what I found very interesting in this is that if you 
first have your load lowered, and then you work on supply, and everyone here knows this, it's gonna make your supply side issues a lot easier. You cut the load in half, all your other problems are in half. You need to have the solar panels, half the cogen, whatever. And that the deepest sort of cutting on the load, you have to think about the building envelope, right? You're not gonna be able to do it just with a higher efficiency equipment if you're leaking air out of the envelope. At some point, you're gonna to have to plug those holes. So there's still sort of a discontinuity, I think, between a 30% cut, which is practically low-hanging fruit, almost all low-hanging fruit, and let's say a 60% cut. We're gonna to have to really look at our buildings in a deeper way, but it's not that big a jump, and we were really getting there uh, while, while I was at NYU. Um, so I was there for five years, and uh, you know we cut the 5%, and then I got the opportunity to go, and instead of working with 70,000 people, work with 8.7 million people, so another, co another uh, couple um, orders of magnitude. And actually, this is a photo from our conference, which was last month, and this is an amazing <coughs> site. This is the uh, commissioner of the New York City Buildings Department holding up proudly, I might add, a sheet of phase change material and telling the New York City real estate community, you should put phase change material in your walls. Put a thermal battery in your wall. That's the future. And I just like to point out what's going on in our world now, that the government is telling private owners, put this stuff in your walls. No one even knows where to buy it or how much it costs or if it works or what it does. But the government's like, we got to do this stuff. I mean, it's sort of breathtaking when you look at where we were just a decade ago and people were arguing. Well, do we even really need to do this at all? Is it cost effective? Maybe we shouldn't recycle. Now we got the city holding up phase change material. I don't even know where I'm going to get this stuff. So um, <laughs> Urban Green, as uh, Ed mentioned, you know, we do a, a lot of uh, work on um, energy policy with the city. We ran a couple task forces, one on uh, green codes and one on uh, uh, building resiliency codes. Uh, we also do a lot of industry education, and we run a lot of public programs. If you're ever down in the city, more than welcome to come uh, to our events. Um, and we focus a lot about carbon. It's not the only thing we do, but obviously it's one of the main things we have to worry about as we look at the future. Um, so one of the most interesting things that uh, we've done while I'm there is a study we call 90 by 50. And the goal is to show that it is possible, this is just one path, it's not the only path, for how uh, New York City could cut its emissions 90% by the year 2050. Um, we're using a 2010 baseline. Uh, New York City has also talked about adopting an 80 by 50 plan. They're talking, that's based on 2005 baseline. So actually 90 by 50 is like 93% cut if you use the 2005 baseline. So these are very, very significant cuts. And so how do we do it? Well, the first thing we did was we made uh, building models, eQuest based, uh, for eight different uh, model building types that we felt represented um, New York City's building. And this was everything from a single family home, a row house, high rise, both masonry and also glass buildings, low rise, uh, residential and also commercial. And then once you built those models, you could scale them up based upon their relative fraction of the overall city square footage and say, okay, now we've got basically a model of the city. Not a perfect model, we only use eight different building types. Obviously the city is a lot more complex than that, but it's a start. And then we could tune those models in eQuest uh, for how they performed until they match the building's inventory of both each type of fuel, so steam, oil, gas, etc., cetera, um, and also their uh, output of uh, greenhouse gases. So once we tune that model, we say, okay, now we've got something that represents how the city was when we started. And then you can start looking and saying, great, what can we do to make these buildings better? We focused on things that we thought were already existing or very near term, again, very achievable. We did not make any assumptions that people were gonna change their behavior. Uh, we did not make any assumptions that there's gonna be some miracle technology that we're just hearing about now that's gonna save us. This is all near term stuff. Number one, you have to seal up building envelopes. You gotta plug the holes. You are going to have to add insulation, whether it's on the inside or the outside. Um, once you've done that, and of course, now you're gonna have to add some sort of uh, uh, forced air into the building. You can't rely on just the drafts to get fresh air into the building, so you're gonna have to do some sort of heat recovery. Um, and once you've done those things, you can really look at cutting the size of your building equipment. Once you've cut down the loads, you can put in smaller equipment. And if you're gonna go 90% cut in your uh, carbon emissions, in the end, you're not gonna be able to use any fossil fuels. Uh, no matter how efficient, you really can't burn any. In fact, for the city to get a 90% cut, 
all of the fossil fuel use that's left is going to have to go to whatever sort of mobile transit that really needs it, that we couldn't find a way to do uh, you know, with other forms of power. So the building's 100% uh, from the grid, or I guess it could be on-site electric, but one way or the other, um, uh, you know, no fossil fuels. And have to have better windows, heat pumps, whatever. And then once you've done that, you've cut the loads, uh, now you can look at your on-site supply. Uh, so when we do that, here's what we get. So these bars, which are probably hard to see from where you're sitting, there's eight bars because those are the source EUI of uh, each of the eight building types in our building model. Um, and these roughly match the, well, the aggregate matches the New York City inventory uh, very closely in terms of present day, and it matches other data that we get from the city, you know, from the utility about what these different building types use. And what we see now is, in, um, uh, you know, in the present day, at this point, four years ago, 51, uh, 51 terawatt hours of um, electric power and just over 400, 400 trillion ETO of fossil fuel use. So the gray box if you can't see is, is the fossil fuel. The green uh, right below it is uh, basically grid power. Um, what were we looking actually comparing to? Well, these bars show existing examples of um, good buildings. So the tallest bar there is the um, Empire State Building retrofit, where they did only things that had very quick paybacks. They didn't even do their sort of tier two things that would have got them uh, deeper cuts. Um, existing buildings, there's a building on the um, Upper West Side that's doing very well. Um, so this is sort of what's already possible because we've seen this happening. And then these bars are uh, our buildings after the 90 by 50 measures have been implemented. And so overall, it's about a 60% cut in actual building usage, actual site use of the buildings. Then when you take the fact that they've gone 100% um, electric and you can get the power from a renewable source, um, that's their actual carbon, carbon intensity, and that's what's being cut by more than 90%. And so that's basically how it works. When you do all that, that is the total electric energy, that sort of second green box used by those buildings in the end state. It's just the same as what we're using now. So basically what you've done, you've taken your buildings, made them more efficient, gotten rid of the fossil fuels, put that all over uh, you know, in the grid power, either that or um, on-site electric, using the same amount of electricity, you've gotten rid of the fossil fuels. Now, what this doesn't show is that the shape of your load curve is very, very different. Right now, obviously, we have a summer afternoon dominated load curve because of AC. Once you do this and you're going to heat pumps, you actually have a winter nighttime dominated load curve. That's the highest point in the curve. Not a great time for solar panels, winter <laughs> nights. Um, even summer nights, frankly, not that great for solar. So we're going to have to look at storage. Um, but again, one thing that I'm very hopeful about is uh, once you cut the loads that low, maybe we don't need incredible storage we, that we haven't seen yet. If the loads are that low, maybe it's actually achievable. Um, that will require renewable energy on a larger scale than we have it now. We already have a fair amount of that kind of energy on our grid. We have hydro, we have a nuke, we have solar, we have wind. It would take more. Uh, there'd be lots of ways of getting there. Here's one option, just to give uh, an example of sort of splitting it um, into different sectors. We would do all these things you know, 17 square miles of uh, solar panels, one nuke, whatnot. If you don't like nukes, great. Get rid of the nuke, put in 34 square miles, you know, of solar, um, at least in terms of the total energy demand. Again, you have to worry about the shape of the load curve to make this happen in real life. Much easier in the model. Um, sounds like a lot, let's say, of solar. Um, I think it's all relative. You know, the city is over 450 square miles, seven miles of sidewalks. Uh, you know, Manhattan, which you think of as a fairly dense place, as uh, things in New York go, seven square miles of backyards, residential backyards, seven square miles on the island of Manhattan alone. I'm not even talking the outer borough. So 17 square miles of panels on that doesn't seem that big. The city owns hundreds of square miles upstate as part of its watershed. You know, that's, you know, that's like around the lakes. Uh, New York City already owns Atlantic to put up solar panels. It actually seems achievable once you've cut the loads. So it's nice to be having this kind of discussion and talking about, well, how would we get all the clean energy we need to run things in the end state? Because it wasn't that long ago we were having more this kind of discussion. You know, you could be at a climate summit and someone says, what if this global warming thing's a big host 
is a big hoax and we've made a better world for nothing. Uh, of course, ignoring all the other co-benefits that you know are gonna are gonna come along with, and we've heard a lot about those uh, this you know at this conference, cleaner air in our buildings, right? People that are healthy, people that are safety, jobs. You know, this is this gonna be a green economy. We don't have to have this conversation anymore, and yet that doesn't mean we should actually not think about those benefits. And I'm not sure that the best way to actually get people excited about making this change is is to tell them. We're all going to die, and it's your fault. There's <laughs> a chance that's not that motivational. Maybe we should be selling them on these benefits. One of those benefits is that people are starting to get worried about things like this. This is a graph of New York City extreme weather events over the past decade. You can see that graph gets higher. We're having more high winds, you know, more storms, more floods, more hurricanes. It's a little scary. Um, Sometimes what comes along with that is a power outage. And we've had a citywide one of those, or at least borough-wide, every couple of years uh, for a decade. Um, maybe we've seen the last one. Uh, when I give this talk in New York City, of course, I say uh, Con Ed wouldn't let that happen. Since there's no one here from Con Ed in this room, I can say it's going to happen. Um, uh, Ron, Andrew, Ron, Andrew, OK, OK. <laughs> Now I'm safe. I knew that was going to come in handy at some point. So OK, what can we do to have our city be safer against those blackouts? Now, actually, after Sandy, uh, which we're all aware of, we got lucky in a way. We didn't get lucky in terms of the storm surge. We didn't get lucky in terms of the power outage. But we got lucky in terms of the outdoor temperature. It's very mild weather during Sandy. If it had been, you know, it was basically in the 50s and 60s for that whole week. Um, if it had been in the middle of winter and that had happened and something had knocked it out, uh, people probably would have frozen to death. They've been in the middle of summer and people are trapped in a high-rise glass building and can't get out, maybe can't even open the windows uh, wide enough to get ventilation, people would have been literally baked alive. I mean, it would have been terrible. We were lucky in that way. And so one thing we looked at as part of the uh, Resiliency Task Force is how better buildings can make them safer um, in the case that these things happen. So we took our building models from a 90 by 50 uh, but this time we just looked at one unit. We didn't look at the whole building of the system. We just looked at a single uh, living unit um, in each of the building types. And then we applied, we looked at the current sort of present day state of construction. And then we made a comparison to what would happen when you air seal and insulate them. And you have a better building envelope. And uh, we get curves that look like this. Here's typical buildings of current vintage. Uh, that currently exists during a winter blackout. And so that black line is where you lose power. All those lines are the temperature inside the building. Um, so you see the line starts off the same at 72, because we all have perfect AC, uh, in this case, uh, heating system that keeps our temperatures exactly at 72 at all times. Then when you lose power, the temperature starts to fall. And within days, uh, in some buildings, uh, you're at dangerously low uh, temps, anything under 50 is where uh, you know, the elderly, people who are sick, are going to start to have uh, health effects. And within a week, which is how long many people uh, were out of power during, uh, during Sandy or longer, it's, it's going to be freezing inside people's houses, or at least dangerously cold. If you air seal and insulate them, you get curves that look more like this. After a week, it's going to be above 55 in the house. Just your body heat is going to keep, uh, you know, keep your apartment or your house warm. So this is a safety issue. Uh, then the reverse is, is uh, going to be true in summer. Here's what a typical buildings look like now, especially the glass buildings, but also in a single family house. Um, within a couple days after a power outage, if you cannot cool that thing off, if you, the windows don't open wide enough to get enough airflow, it's a super hot day. By the way, this is not a super hot day. We use actual weather data for the 12 months leading up to Sandy, and we had had a very mild winter and a fairly mild summer, you know, like the summer before. So. This is not even as hot as we're going to see it. But you will see uh, killer temperatures inside buildings uh, within days. If it's uh, air sealed and it's insulated, you've got much more control. You're going to be uncomfortable, uh, but you probably won't die. And in a city where people cannot get out of their buildings without power, uh, if they're in a high building, this is a, this is a big deal. Um, what do you do to make these things happen and make the buildings more resilient? The same things you're going to do to save carbon. You're going to seal them up tight. Uh, you're going to use sunshade. You're going to have better windows. You know, it's going to be insulation. Uh, these are all things that we know how to do today. So that's the good news. Um, one of the other co-benefits, co-benefits. Here's actually NYU with that uh, 13 megawatt cogen. It was one of the few places that had lights during Sandy. Uh, it could actually black start. 
uh, it was running on natural gas, which did not get the cutoff, and it had lights, and it could keep its occupant happy. Um, so can we do this? Can we do this citywide? There's one million buildings in the city of New York. That's a lot of retrofits. You know, we're not building enough new construction that we're going to get there uh, you know, in time. Well, I would argue if we don't do that, if we don't do it, we're going to get things like this. Um, I actually lived in that dark zone. It was fun for the first night or two. Uh, after that, it got a little bit old, walking up and down you know, the seven flights of steps uh, with a flashlight. Um, so if we don't want this, we may have to do something. And we've got other reasons that we probably will do something, at least in many buildings. We have a lot of buildings in the city, uh, masonry buildings. Masonry had a design lifetime. And uh, the cheaper those buildings were built, and uh, after World War II, we saw a lot of fairly cheap buildings go up, even ones with high rents. Doesn't mean they were built expensively. Um, we're seeing things like this. This is a white brick building on the Upper East Side. Uh, Concrete backer block is actually crumbling. It was not strong enough to handle the load of the building facade after 50 years. You've got cracks running down the facade. You've got uh, sagging headers where a metal header over windows is uh, actually uh, rusting and the bricks are literally sagging on top. So you have people that are gonna have to fix their building facade because they've got bricks falling off onto people's heads. And even in New York City where there's always a bigger headline, no one likes that. Right? You want that to happen at least in other cities or at least in another borough, not in your borough. So people are going to be fixing these buildings. Now, can we sell owners on this prospect? You can spend, let's say, $100 and repoint that building so the bricks don't fall off and you don't kill anyone, or you can spend $150 or $200 or $250, lots more money, but to have that building last for another 50 years instead of another 10 years and having to go back and do it again. And not only that, it will have a payback. You will see, you'll see the savings in energy, you'll have better air quality, because you have better control, and you won't just have the New York City air coming in where and when it wants to. And your tenants won't complain, because they don't have the drafts. They've got temperature control. And they hate the fact that you are outside their unit with a lift every 18 months fixing their window frame or the mortar on their bricks and drilling in there and making noise. They hate that. They pay a lot in New York City. They don't like it when you make noise outside your unit. So you can sell them on, here's what we're, we're, we're going to do to make you happier. That sounds like a selling point. Maybe we can actually get people behind. I also think a fantastic opportunity, uh, Castle Square in Boston, a uh, uh, low-income uh, multi-family unit. Uh, Joe, who was here yesterday, actually worked on this project. Uh, Building Science was the energy consultants on this. Uh, built in the 60s, looked like this. After the retrofit, looked like this. It's better looking buildings. Who doesn't want a better looking city? The people in this building may have pride in their building after this is done. Yeah, they were more comfortable. They were the ugliest building on the block. Everything else that had gone up newer looked nicer than their building. And there was nothing that they could do about it because they weren't the rich people, right? Once this was done, they were proud. They had a nice looking building again, and they felt good about it. People say, can this be done in 30 years? I agree. It's a lot. 30, that's one million buildings in New York City is a lot. On the other hand, I like to do the thought experiment of standing in one of, you know, let's say, uh, one of the early six story, you know, office buildings downtown, you know, on Broadway in, let's say, 1880, 1890, looking out the window horses, right? The streets filled with horses. And telling someone in 30 years, every one of these, every one of these horses will be gone. Well, it's impossible. How are we going to get food into the city? How are we going to get people around? You can't do it without horses. There's no other way. It's impossible. In 30 years, all those horses were gone. Lots of other examples of disruptive technology. You've been hearing from them uh, this whole day. Many of them are currently being developed over at the labs that we saw yesterday. So. And what's great is we can actually do this with what we actually have now. All that stuff's just going to make it easier. It's going to make it cheaper. It's going to make it scalable. But we already know how to do this. We're at a very special time. We, those of us in this business who have been in this business um, a long time, and while well, my hair is mostly gray, it's not the grayest in the room, thank God. Um, <laughs> but I'm getting there. Don't worry. Um, we've been pushing on government for 25 years well, really four years, let's say, uh, since the first oil embargo, people, we got to do something. And it's been a hard slog. And now we see the politicians saying it. We see them marching at the People's Climate March with 400,000 people saying, we've got change. We see New York City calling for 80 by 50 as city policy. And 
getting ready to back it up with a plan to do it. Um, those of us working in energy efficiency, I, I, I feel it's a little bit like when you're walking against a strong wind, walking an incredible headwind, and you're leaning forward just to keep upright. If that wind suddenly stops, you might fall on your face. And we're going to have to pivot as the politicians start to say, yes, we should do this. Let's cut 80 by 50. OK, well, we, we are the people who are there to tell them how to actually do it. And uh, while we're going to need everything in our bag of tricks, the time to say, like, here's a set of interventions, and you'll get 15% savings in your building with a five-year payback, that's not on the scale that's going to get it there. We have to think about how to go farther, faster, and do it in a cheap and also a scalable way. Um, because this is version 2.0 now. We're starting to win the battle. I know it's different in you know, different places. I'm a little bit of a bubble down in the city. But it's starting to happen more and more that the time to ask for the change is passed, and the time to make the change is here. So uh, a few final questions to ponder, and then I will take uh, your questions. One is, is the role of cogen generally a fossil fuel-based uh, thing? It doesn't have to be. I guess you could have a biomass-based cogen, but that will probably be more of a niche thing. If we need to go fossil fuel-free and over heat pumps in the long term, what's the role of cogen now? Right now, you get great efficiency savings by going to cogen, and gas is very cheap. Um, should, should we be putting in cogen now and just thinking, well, the plant's got a 30-year design lifetime. Let's put it in, and when it wears out, we won't actually replace it. We'll be on to something else. Or do we try to get buildings to make the jump straight to all electric? And super efficient heat pumps might actually be more expensive for them now, but they'll be in the right place later. That's sort of a tough call to make. You have to involve the policymakers. That's not just a building level choice. Um, I said, you know, smart central controls or sim uh, sorry, smart central controls or simple local controls. This is something I see a lot of sort of. There's two threads in the building efficiency. Uh, world. There's lots of people who say codes are getting stronger every year, actually 90.1, you know, 50% more stringent than it was basically, you know, a little over a decade ago. Get, getting more stringent, the only way to get there is hyper smart controls, light bulbs that know if there's a low response, you know, uh, event happening, you know, a demand response event, what's the temperature, well, how much daylight am I getting, should the occupants open the window or not, I'll flash at you, all this stuff, chips everywhere, central systems, saw reports back, okay. That may be the right. But the other way is people are saying, all these central systems, they have idle power. Every chiller in a big building, it never turns all the way off. Because someone might want you know, a call for cooling even at 3 a.m. So that thing's an idle. It's always self-consuming. If you want these super low buildings, we have to have equipment that goes all the way off. Why not just local controls? You know, Simple units on each floor, simple occupancy sensor. It goes off when no one's there. Maybe we need both of these things, but it's something to think about as you're doing uh, uh, your work and your designs. Another thing, do we need custom solutions for every retrofit, or can we make these things uh, scalable? Right now, every building's a snowflake, right? Every architect and every engineer in this room will say, to do this right, you need to go in, really look at the building. Every building's different. No two are like, well, that's true. We all know that everyone, anyone who's ever worked on a building portfolio and said, why does this building use so much energy? It's never the exact same answer for two buildings. That said, do we have the time and the money to get 100% of the way to make every building perfect? Is there a way we can find things that might get us 80 or 90% of the way at 20 or 30% of the cost by making them routine? The things that have gotten big quick, whether it's cell phones, cars, whatever, they became standardized. And that's how we were, they were able to grow very quickly. And finally, as I mentioned before, energy storage. If we're going to shift our load curve so much when we get off of um, Fossil fuels, do we need advanced energy storage, something crazy that we don't have now? Do we need to be putting phase change materials in our walls? Why not? New York City says it's the thing to do immediately. Um, or if we just coat our loads as much as we have, can we do it with lead acid batteries? You know, The house I built uh, in Missouri, uh, six people live there, and you know we had a um, battery bank, lead acid batteries, cheap, 100% recyclable, uh, easy to maintain. Uh, could run the building for four to five days with zero solar input and would fit basically under a king size bed. That's a, a small battery room for that building. So if you cut the loads enough, maybe that's all you need. Um, I'm going to end with the rainbow because <laughs> you're at the end of the rainbow and on the other side of the rainbow is a beer. Uh, paid for by Ed. You know, they say we say it enough times it becomes true. <laughs> okay, it's not true. It doesn't matter how many times I say it. 
Um, we're being asked to do this. We, we've been saying it's possible, and now's the time we gotta actually deliver the goods. I'm glad to be in this room. I feel like I'm home with the people that are working to make this happen, who can see what it physically takes to make this happen. And we've got this great opportunity, whether you're in a rural house, whether you're in New York City, where there's a passive house, a multifamily building uh, that's uh, now been built, uh, we can do it. So good luck to you all, and thank you very much. My name is Larry Wetzel, um, and I'm uh, owner of Air Innovations here at Syracuse. But I was wondering um, if carbon credits might play a role in your strategy. And by carbon credits? Carbon credits. People that earn carbon credits for retrofitting buildings. Sure. Well, there's a lot of tools you can get to change the equation of why people don't act now and why they might act. It could be a carbon tax, it could be cap and trade, it could be carbon credits. It's a great idea. I mean, at those point, those things, in the end, although they'll be informed by very advanced financial analysis, it's more of a political question, I think, than really, you know, like a technical one. But we need to be ready to help the politicians understand, here's how it would work, and here's what we're trying to achieve. Yeah. When you're talking about reducing the loads, obviously the generation, the electricity, still could be coming from fossil fuels. And I wonder if you're concerned at all that if you make that huge effort and reduce the loads, some folks in the fossil fuel might say, well, look, we're not so bad anymore. Well, I mean, I think that's a great point. And I mean, I think it's, I think it's true. And in fact, if uh, we only had to get to 60% cuts, we might say, don't even worry about the, you know, the supply side. Let's just do it on the demand side because that has all these other benefits. Um, one thing that's happening, again, we did 90 by 50 trying not to count on any disruptive change in the future. Let's say we might sort of straight line out some sort of guesses for the future, but let's not make any advanced guesses. But it's not a super advanced guess to see the cost of cost of solar dropping like a stone. I mean, even at this point, but like the cost curve, other than the fact that gas also dropped unexpectedly, right? The solar would be would actually be cheaper now, right? So I can't, no one's got a crystal ball to say what will happen in 30 years, but it's hard for me to imagine not, there not being some sort of cost parity for like the renewable solutions when you look out 30 years, when you look at what's happened over the past year. I'm just curious, are you, Great. Have you looked at integrating your models um, with there was a, a paper done by Mark Jacobson and another team at Cornell that looked at how New York State could power all of New York State with resources available within the state um, and Long Island Sound. Okay. Yeah, uh, that was a great study. Um, I'm sure there's lots of holes that can be poked into it because it was pretty, uh, pretty high level. I sort of, you know, at this stage, I think those things are more of a scoping study. They say, do our natural resources roughly correspond with the loads we need to serve. It's not, and I think that's the same thing for 90 by 50. Again, like right now the 90 by 50, it's not a plan. It doesn't say here's how you get from here to there. It doesn't even say that the way we map that is the best way to get from here to there. We assume a certain increase in efficiency uh, in let's say lighting, and then you do lots of air sealing. Maybe if your lighting got even better, you wouldn't need to do as much air sealing, you know, or something like that. Same thing for uh, Mark's study. Um, he shows that this is possible. And so, yeah, I think these things actually go together very well. But we haven't worked actually specifically to, to join those. You, yeah. Uh, so you talked about the place in Boston where they actually worked on the outside, and and, and so, so one thing I've always lost all hope for is that masonry buildings they're never going to allow you to do things on the outside. There's too many concerns about the way it looks. But it sounds like you you're a lot more hopeful that can happen. Do you, you have examples hopeful. in New York? Yeah, I do, and I actually, now that you mentioned, so first of all, I should say that the uh, recladding that we saw in Boston that the Joe worked on had a 60% cut uh, in its energy use. So they were able to go from uh, giant uh, boilers, you know, 30 MMBT or something like that, to little boilers. It's a big deal in New York. It means they get small, that light, you can put them on the roof instead of in the basement, which means you're in a flood zone. you got resiliency again, so there's lots of benefits to that. The building I showed that was actually in New York where the uh, facade was sort of cracking, falling off, I probably should have showed a before and after photo. They actually reclad it and now has a second skin. Um, the one in uh, Boston is a terracotta panel. The one in New York is a uh, metal panel. 
Uh, they look amazingly similar, actually, very durable. Um, the big thing in New York is when you have a lot line and you can't make your building any wider. One thing that's been done in New York is now at least you don't have a zoning penalty for adding insulation. But if you're up against your lot line, there's nothing you can do. Luckily, in New York, lots of the bigger masonry buildings are freestanding, right? It's like the tower in the park model. And all of the projects, all the low-income housing, you've got square mile after square mile of uh, rectangular or sort of plush-shaped brick buildings that there's nothing around them. There's no harm to putting the insulation on the outside. It's easier than actually going into the tenant units. And uh, they'll look better for it. So I, I actually am more hopeful. But that can't be the whole solution. As you say, there's lots of buildings where that just will never happen. And we'll have to find other solutions. Cliff? Uh, Cliff Davidson from Syracuse University. Uh, really enjoyed your talk. Um, I, I, real, I guess I wanted to get your, your take on uh, the fact that even though the costs of solar panels are going down, for, for sure, solar PV is becoming economically more attractive, uh, but in fact the environmental costs of solar PV are still pretty high. Uh, producing solar panels uses a lot of toxic materials and so forth. So I'm just wondering if you have a, a comment on that. Oh, I think that's a fantastic point. And anyone who thinks like, well, if you make the power with solar, then you're good, right? That's all you have to do. Obviously, you're missing a whole part of the equation. How much energy did it make to the panel? What's its embodied energy? What's its, what's its energy payback? What are the toxics? Again, this is why after all these years from the Eco Village through to the university, through to working with New York City, I focus on the demand side. Because if you cut your demand in half, you cut all those all those toxics in half. And I think 30 years from now, we'll get to choose. Well, maybe solar is not even the best way. Maybe we think we have a better way than solar. Um, but, but all of those choices get much easier when you're cut your load by 60%. Over here. Here, and then we'll go to the back. Jim McKnight of uh, Summerhill Biomyosystems. Uh, the, uh, it's going to take 50 years or something even more and in the meantime, the carbon dioxide level in the atmosphere is going to continue to go up. And, this, and so just leveling out to go to net zero is going to mean that the problem we've got with the weather now is going to get worse. So what we need to do is go beyond what you're doing now. That's your next task <laughs> is to figure out how to consistently make a net reduction in the total amount of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. I'll be interested in your answer. <laughs> <laughs> well, again, we, you know, if you're driving towards the cliff, the first step is take your foot off the accelerator, right? So that's what we're doing in buildings. Um, New York has some, I, first of all, I think you're totally right, right? We need to look at what we're doing as not just doing less bad, if we're going to get to a good place, we need to think about doing good, having our buildings be net positive. New York is a particularly challenging environment for that because it is so dense. Um, the idea of buildings being net zero you know, or net positive is sort of challenging, and we do draw a lot from the, from the surrounding area. Um, I think you pose a good point. Right now, while we might need to look at the next step, I'd be pretty pleased if we had a plan to cut New York City's emissions 90% by 2050. And, uh, but that doesn't mean we shouldn't uh, keep thinking about uh, what's going to come next after that. Oh, we're going to go to the back and then we'll come up. Yes, uh, Jason Zhang from Syracuse University. Uh, thank you again for the, for the wonderful Please presentation. I want to go back to this retrofitting envelope uh, uh, issues. I know you, you, you mentioned you use exterior insulation, and for some buildings, uh, you, can, you can apply that. Now, I know in Germany and in Europe, uh, when they want to protect the outside the appearance of the you know, especially historical buildings, they actually use, uh, for example, the calcium silicate materials for interior insulation that can also take care of moisture problems. Is something like this happening in New York City also, or are there any opportunities for this kind of technology? Uh, it seems like there's a fantastic opportunity. I haven't seen it happen. Uh, I haven't seen it happen yet in the city. I mean, the interesting thing about like the cost drivers um, for this type of work, it's not necessarily what you expect. It's not the cost of the material, and sometimes it's not like a technological issue. It's a labor issue. It's a design issue. And I've done projects, not specifically on envelope, but let's say uh, boiler retrofits, going to gas, where it's like you can spend you know one hundred thousand dollars on the boiler, and a hundred thousand dollars on a new chimney liner, and two hundred thousand dollars on the scaffolding you need to set up to put in the new chimney liner. 
right? So it's like, I, who cares about boiler technology? I need scaffolding technology. And so some of that I think is true for like the facade issues. It's like there's lots of ways to make a better facade and people in this room are hopefully gonna be working on them. Um, we need a quicker and easier way to get it up there that doesn't involve someone dangling, you know, 80 feet off the ground trying to, you know, use a screw gun to put on giant panels that, you know, aren't modular. We need uh, something where you can drill tiny holes uh, on the, you know, interior drywall and little mosquito size robots go in there and fill the whole thing full of, you know, some sort of insulation or something like that. And it's automated and teeny holes that are easy to patch. Whatever it is, I don't know what it is, but that's what it may take to make things go to scale. Thank you. So our opening keynote speaker is gonna have the last question for the Perfect last question. question. All right. <laughs> that's a lot of, of pressure. <laughs> if, if, the, if the beer is free, I'll make it a really good one. Um, so Bill Bonfla from Penn State, and uh, really great talk. You, you addressed this on the sort of the building by building let's take energy out of buildings uh, point of view, uh, but you just alluded to the density of, of New York City, uh, for example. Uh, could you give us some con uh, context about the whole uh, community planning issue and uh, the buildings <coughs> combined with transportation and industry? Because uh, looking just at buildings, and particularly looking at one building at a time, is another example of, of kind of uh, uh, siloing things and maybe solving a problem that's too narrowly defined. What about the big picture and how this all fits in and can we get there uh, from that point of view? That, that is a fantastic question and it's true. I do tend to have a New York City centric way of looking at things. Far, far be it to be said that we've licked the problem of uh, transit in the city. There's a lot of areas in the city that don't have subway. There's still a lot of cars in New York City, but we're way better off than almost anywhere in the country in terms of not having to have a car to get around. Probably most folks have seen the stats that show that if you have a reasonably efficient house, not a super efficient house, just a reasonably uh, you know, efficient house, you don't have to live very far from work before your emissions from your commute are bigger than your uh, house emissions from the, you know, from the energy you use in your home. And so it might actually be better to build a less efficient house cheaper, uh, closer to where you work than it is to go way out in the country, let's say, and build a uh, you know a super efficient house. That was why it was so important at the Eco Village. We had a car co-op and actually tried to cut the vehicle miles, um, as well as just the house emissions. Um, I do think it's interesting in terms of transit. I mean, I saw a lot of nods when I said, "Hey, you got to attack the demand in a building first, then worry about supply. You don't try to put solar panels um, on a house to uh, supply waste." Right? Oh, we have like a plasma TV that's drawing 30 watts all the time. Let's put enough solar on to like, you know, supply that phantom load. That makes no sense. I think people get that concept. But for our cars, we spend a lot of time as a culture talking about what the, what's going to be the next vehicle technology. Is it going to be electric or be fuel cell? What will we do? And very little time talking about how to get people to have to drive less and have walkable cities, have people not have that commute. Um, New York is working on that as well. And it's actually part of the city's long-term plan is Build where there are subways. Let there be more density where there's mass transit. Don't make people drive. Um, that's a challenging conversation on a, on a national scale. Um, but I think you're right. If we're going to fully deal with the problem, I don't see how we can get there without necessarily grappling it. Um, I'll leave with this final thought, which is um, New York City is 5 billion square feet of building. That's a lot. Uh, China is building 20 billion square feet of new buildings every year building four New Yorks every year. Uh, maybe it's not a fair comparison, but if by 2050, China's gonna build the equivalent of like 100 New York cities, I really hope we can fix our one by then. When you look at it that way, it seems very possible, and I know you all will be there to help. Thank you very much.